tripods so people haven't met. Um, okay. Is the mic working? Yeah. My name's still Brad Hards. Um, I'm going to talk about working with the Microsoft Exchange protocols, and work probably really is a good description here because it mostly does. The demos are even pretty cool. You can come in too, it's all right. Um, it, you should read this while I talk. In 2004, Jeff Ward gave a talk about GNOME, and at the start of it, he put up this bit, GNOME versus KDE. If you can't read this on the screen and you want to uh, read it on your laptop, just put in to Google the words GNOME, KDE, and vomit. <laughs> Spilled beer will do it too, but that's a bit harder to get spelled right. So it's basically just a... <laughs> I think they were actually the speakers from the last one, but... I want it to look just like that. <laughs> this is the open change kit. Have pe mostly people finished reading it. Um, Jeff Waugh claimed to have been at that party. There's a KDE part of this as well. People mostly finish reading. If, if you want to read this on your laptop, GNOME, KDE, and Vomit are the keywords you're looking for in Google. It's the number one hit. Vomit. Spilled beer is a good one too. I wouldn't, those, are the only, those are the only combinations I've tried. People finish reading that, mostly. Here's a KDE developer we prepared earlier. <laughs> Yep, almost 20 years ago to the day. And that's an L1A1 self-loading rifle for those who don't recognise it. 7.62 millimetre, 900 metres per second muzzle velocity, didn't affect me in the least. <laughs> and if it would all be okay with all of you, please turn off your mobile phone. <laughs> okay. So, I've got my cheat sheet notes. Um, I'm going to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You want to talk about lots of KDE stuff, I'll talk about that. You want to talk about lots of open change stuff, you want to, I'll talk about that. Um, if you don't say anything, what I'm going to do is basically take questions as we go. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Akinati, that's the framework in KDE 4 series for personal information management. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about open change, about why and what. Um, I'm going to show how those two things fit together. Um, I'm going to do some demos. Some of them are going to work. Some of them are going to show KD 4.3 trunk subversion crashing, unless I'm really delicate with the mouse. Um, I'm going to talk about the future for where I think this stuff can go and st stuff that I'm personally interested in. I'm going to ask all of you for lots of help. Um, I'm going to let the Microsoft guys come in. Um, and I'm going to talk about anything else you guys want to talk about. So truly, um, you guys paid to come here and I got to go to the speakers dinner and eat really cool food and drink alcohol for nothing. <laughs> um, so I owe you. Um, so 
Let's talk a little bit about Akinati. Um, KDE 3.5 had quite a sophisticated personal information management suite. We did address books, we did mail. Those things kind of got fudged together um, with some other applications. They really ran as separate processes, but it looked kind of like we were running them as a single groupware application called Contact. Um, I guess PIM is, should not be understood to be just mail. As hackers, we kind of use mail a lot to access. Um, but certainly in my workplace, um, I do work in a major government department that should remain nameless, um, if only for the things it's done wrong. Um, there's quite a lot of use of Outlook. And the main part that I see the real dependency in, in Outlook and Exchange is, is not really on mail. Mail's important, but the part that we don't, I mean, you can use IMAP with Exchange to, if you, what you really wanted was the mail. But seeing other people's calendars and making shared appointments, those are really, really key things in a lot of big organisations. You can't get appointments with some people unless you send them a meeting invitation. Um, moving back to the KDE side, um, so we're not just talking about mail, but moving back to the KDE side, Kmail is a fairly big maintainability problem for KDE. Um, it was really hard. The migration from Acute 3 base to Acute 4 base, the, the changes that we saw, we didn't make Kmail in, in 4.0. Um, it's a huge amount of code. Some of it is pretty good. Some of it I'd prefer not be working on. It, it's a single application that has everything from the user interface all the way through the networking, a lot of networking code at least. Um, it's very hard to get into. Big barrier to accessibility between C++, needing to know user interface, needing to know networking. Um, really not a pleasant thing to be working on. Um, and, and that was recognised that we needed to do something better. And in the KDE 4 series, so this is not a 4.0 or 4.1 or 4.2 concept, this is a KDE 4 concept. I want to separate the networking part from the user interface part. And I'll show a little diagram. Um, we also wanted to solve some technical problems, um, like concurrent access to, to some of the back ends was a real problem. Address books didn't really like being accessed. Um, the other thing about Akinati is that it's not Qt or KDE specific, at least not at the design level. There are some current implementation things that make it fairly KDE specific and if there were more drinks to be had, I'd talk about why that got us in a bit of trouble with free desktop, um, but I won't talk about it here. In an architectural sense, what we really are saying is that we're going to have clients, that'd be this nice blue box, that talk to some central server that maybe does some caching and those in turn are going, that's going to arbitrate access to some resources. So this represents the back end side. And this is really the idea behind Akinati, at least the way I see it. And these links, so sad. <laughs> these, these links are Dbus. So this is, an in, this is not a single process. This is an inter-process communication concept. So we make Dbus calls into the Akinati server and that talks across to at least one, but potentially multiple resources. And this might be an IMAP resource. So this is not the IMAP server. This is the client side part of IMAP, but running as a separate process. Equally, it might be doing ICAL files as a local file access. So not necessarily network things. It might be a local address book. Those are all sorts of things that you would have as a resource. This server arbitrates access, does some caching, and multiple clients can exist on this side. So you might have your contact version running, looking at the address book. Equally, you might want to run something in KOffice that also wants to see the address book. Or out of the networking code for something like um, Copita, where you want to drag out people's uh, sorry, instant messaging addresses. All those things talk the same protocol, Dbus, with some library stuff on this side and on this side to make it a bit easier to talk to these shared resources. And that's really the idea between, behind Akinati, to separate this previously monolithic code base 
into a set of individual blocks that do inter-process communication over Dbus. The protocol that runs on top of Dbus looks a lot like IMAP. It's a text-based thing for people who have seen that sort of stuff before. A little bit about open change. Um, this is a project to implement the Microsoft Exchange protocols. And by that we mean as used by Outlook. So we're not talking about having to turn on IMAP or WebDAV or anything else that's really ugly. Um, we want to use the Exchange RPC protocol just like Outlook does. Um, it's a no kidding free, like we'd love for you to come and help us hack on it and we've got Subversion, you can see Trunk and you can raise tickets in our track. Um, open source GPL V3, the reason for V3 relates to some Samba stuff but also to some, some other advantages that gives us that I'd love to talk about. Um, client and server side, much more work on the client so far but, but we do have server code runs and you can get a little bit of Outlook connection to it. And as I said, we don't just want to do mail here. Mail is probably the easiest of the problems that we have to solve. The stuff that's really hard is people's address books, their contacts, the calendaring, notes, journaling, public folders, free busy, a whole heap of things that you don't see in sort of a home networking situation but become really big deals in a in a big organisation. I'd say enterprise and be buzzword compliant. There's lots of doco and here's where the Microsoft guys would love to tell you about it. This, this side, and you should pass those around because I'm sure everyone else wants to have one of those too. And I've got lots more at the front. Um, the front side has a whole heap of, that I handed out, has a whole heap of URLs. And the other side has some marketing fluff that the marketing guys made, the technical guys put on the front. Um, uh, you're looking at the other side. No, they're all bad. <laughs> um, so, yep, there's, there's a whole stack of PDF documentation um, and it's mostly pretty good. Um, the guys, it gets updated pretty regularly. Um, there's more of it than I've read. There's probably more of it than I could read in the amount of time I have. Um, it's reasonably well organised. Um, the bad news is that some of it is pretty ugly. That'd be because the stuff it's describing is pretty ugly. Um, and I'll talk about why that's not a problem for the exchange side in just a moment. But yeah, we're working off uh, certainly the original work on open change was not done off protocol documentation. It was done off wire captures. Um, almost never. <coughs> um, certainly run tests to verify the documentation. M actually in my case more to verify that my reading of the documentation and my coding skills vaguely matched what it should have been. Um, the documentation makes much, much fewer mistakes than I make. Absolutely. Um, and mostly the sort of problems that we've raised have been inconsistencies. One, says it, one document says it's one byte, another one says it's two bytes. One of them is going to be right. At most one of them is going to be right. Uh, it, exchange has far fewer of those sorts of, there's some like what were they thinking in the design stage, but at least it's documented. It'll tell you. Um, some stuff is pretty ugly to deal with. Um, depending on this, you get whole new bits of structure in the middle, and that's really ugly to encapsulate in an IDL environment, but, but we do it. Um, certainly the documentation helped enormously. We would not be, I would not be doing demos that showed a lot of real operations without that documentation. We've made much more progress. Um, um, so the client side, um, it exists as a set of C libraries and client utilities. There is some work on top of those things, C++ libraries that uh, my summer of code student did 
during our winter. Um, Google, North American focus, who would have guessed? Um, there's a fair amount of work being done on some handwritten Python bindings. So they're Pythonic style Python bindings for people who care about that stuff. We have suite based bindings for the C code for people who like Perl. Don't know what you were thinking either. Um, that, that code is maturing pretty well. Um, out of the 120 odd remote procedure calls, we currently implement about 88. Um, and they're mostly right. And of those, probably 80 have unit tests behind them. Um, we also have some stuff around the edges, um, a thing called open change property files. When I do the demos, it'll become a bit more apparent. But if you're going to send a mail on the command line, you're going to end up with quite a lot of variations. Or you want to create a calendaring appointment because you can say when it starts and ends, that's kind of obvious, and what the title is, and the description. And then there's a few other things that people might want to do, like which categories it belongs to, and whether it's recurring, and how the recurrence works, and that stuff gets a bit carried away. So about the time we had a set of man pages that was looking uglier than GCC's man page in terms of the number of options, we went, enough. We'll have a, a little property file that basically has an any style format, key, value, and so you can say, make an appointment that has all of these properties as specified in my little file. And we've got another thing that says, suck off the appointment with these ident numbers, or the, the activity with these ident numbers, and make that into a property file. So then you can just fudge it up because it's like a template. And that's really useful for some of the things I'll talk about in just a second. The guy who deserves the credit for this is not me. I'll take a little bit of credit in just a moment. Thank you for your time. Um, Julien Kerhul, um, a French developer, um, truly amazing guy. Almost all of the code he wrote, um, all of the IDL, I've coded like 1% of it. Um, the um, other guys that I'd like to recognize, um, Yelma Vinoy. Um, he did a lot of the build system work. He's also a, a, a very, very prolific Samba developer. Um, um, Dan Shearer, people may know Dan. He was a, well, I still think he's an Australian guy. Lives in Scotland now. Um, he's done a lot of the technologist work for us. Dealing with, with Microsoft has been part of his work. Um, particularly getting started, that was really important. Um, a couple of Summer of Code students, Alan Alvarez, who did the C++ and a lot of the open change work. That's, it's a bit rotted a little bit under my management, so I'll take responsibility for most of the bugs. Um, and a guy um, from China, Yang Yang Li, who did some work on a, on a POP3 proxy, fetch mail proxy. Um, and some other guys. I mean, we are getting a few contributions. Um, French company um, Alinto has has done some good work. Um, and also I'll show the work that some, uh, some of the evolution guys have done from Novell. So why are we trying to do open change? This kind of represents the, the sort of typical situation. We're not just trying to do mail. We're trying to do calendaring, notes, your address book, to-do lists, all of that time management stuff. Right now, with some not very important exceptions, the protocol that runs across here is a thing called Exchange RPC. People also know it as MAPI. MAPI is really the API, the application program or programmer interface that exists at this stage. Exchange RPC is a sort of a network encapsulation of it at the 30,000 foot view. Um, so we're interested in the idea that you should be able to change out some of your clients or introduce new clients. Obviously using nice, much nicer looking machines. 
Um, and you don't need to change this back end. You don't need to change the configuration because if you do that, then at some point there'll be pushback. I mean, I use Exchange and, and Outlook in a, in a high security environment. People are going to be really tense if I load anything on the desktop. Changing the desktop and the server environments at the same time, that's not going to work. In a lot of places, um, we don't want to change everyone at once. What could go wrong, right? Um, there's also some places where you might want to change your server back end or you might want to introduce a new server um, and let people use some, some newer features. So being able to put a different server in the back end and okay, there's going to be some migration work here to copy across the, the users and the public folders and all that sort of stuff. But if you didn't have to retrain the users, didn't have to change your standard operating environment configuration, those would be things that would really help. And potentially, you can get into this heterogeneous idea where you might want to be able to run either of these, or maybe some combination, and run both these things depending on what your users really needed. The idea that you should have a standard operating environment might be really easy, but there was a keynote that talked about trusting people and letting them have the tools they want and all that sort of stuff. Even if they're wrong. Um, what we'll do for the back end is not really sorted yet. Probably what we'll end up trying to do is backing it onto a full database. There's a whole heap of database semantics that come out of the Exchange RPC protocol. And so the logical back end would probably be some kind of database, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, whatever you like. But that will, for some implementation reasons, that will probably be easier. Having looked a lot at the operations, they're absolutely asking for database operations. I mean, the, the fundamental units in, in the description for the protocol, I mean, you don't have to implement it like this, but the, the, the conceptual stuff says table and row. Um, and, and the core of exchange is basically a database. Uh, I think probably for historical reasons. It's a front end on a, an embedded database. Yeah. Bear in mind, I haven't seen um, the internals of a Exchange server. I've never administered one. And, and my interest is certainly more on the client side. Um, but certainly looking at the protocol stuff, it's tables and rows. Um, and there's some other things you can do. Once you've got a set of client libraries and some bindings, it doesn't just need to be a, a desktop environment. That There's a whole stack of things you can push into this sort of server. New applications, um, new ideas. Um, the open change property file idea could get us to something like where you can take track or subversion and not just create a mail in your post commit hook but you could create a task and that task could depend on what was modified creating tasks for the right people there's a whole stack of really interesting integration things you can do when you get to this level even if you don't care about replacing exchange even if you're stuck with replacing exchange doesn't matter because on the client side, we can still interoperate with the, with that server, with no changes. It'll look just like Outlook, except it'll work better. On on the client side, um, we have some client side tools, and I'm going to show those. Those basically work. They're not super friendly. 
okay, for this community, it's pretty friendly. <laughs> like there's formatting and stuff. Um, I wouldn't expect my partner to use them. Um, there's an evolution um, integration. I'm going to show some screenshots of that. Getting that to build and run hasn't been a big thing for me because I'm more interested in this subsequent thing, Katie and Akinati. Um, but and no, the Novell guys didn't start this, but certainly they did a lot of work on this. Um, and there were some licensing issues. GPL v2 evolution and GPL v3 Samba and then GPL v3 Samba and Open Change basically caused a bit of trouble. Um, I won't talk too much about that because I'm not super familiar with it, but certainly overcoming that was important for the release. This, and, and I didn't create this screenshot, this actually came from one of the uh, Novell developers, um, shows a live connection from Evolution using Exchange RPC to pull off mail on Exchange 2007 server. I'll, I'll mail you the, uh, the screenshots, Chris, it's okay. Um, and okay, we said mail was pretty easy, and not very important. Um, the address book, this is the address book on the Exchange 2007 server. The calendar on Exchange 2007 server. Memos, to-do lists. I mean, I think that's pretty damn cool. That Um, basic setup, um, just server type equals, exchange mapping, type in the name of the server, your username, the domain, make it happen. The KDE one is not that good yet. In fact, it's got a little way to go. Um, but you can all come and help me hack on it. Question at the back? The question was how far away is a usable build um, of evolution that works with Exchange? Um, my understanding is about as close as an OpenSUSE build farm. You can download packages. Um, I personally haven't tried and therefore wouldn't like to say whether they're really great or really terrible. Um, The, the answer over there was scheduled for release in, in first quarter, 226 for, for GNOME. Bob. Um, my experience has mostly been testing with, um, with Exchange 2003. I know the, the Novell guys do a lot of testing with 2007. Um, you probably need to turn on the thing that says work with early versions of Outlook. Um, there's some reasons why that's important that we will be able to fix but have not yet been fixed. For people who are familiar with what SMB did, there was an SMB to SMB2 change. There was a protocol change like that. Um, and the way that we will probably deal with it is to go, and on the server side, is probably to go, we don't speak it. Um, but on the client side, I, I understand that there's a problem authenticating if you didn't put the right, and it, I think it ends up looking like it turned on public folders, but exactly what the change is, I haven't seen. So it should just work, but you may need to say, and work with early versions of, of Outlook. More questions? Public folders work. I don't think I have a demo, but I could try and make one up maybe. Um, the question was about how big are the exchange address books. Um, mine has about one test sample in it. Um, the 
And the reason is that I run the development environment and the test environment on my laptop. Um, so it's a little, little concerning. Um, and there's certainly going to be some, I mean, I had a guy tell me that he had 40,000 emails in his inbox and it just streamed them out. I was pretty surprised. Um, there's, there's no reason why that sort of stuff shouldn't work, but how fast it works when you've got a huge number on a GUI application, that may require some tweaking. There's, there's some hacks and some really cool RPC calls you can do to say, find me the tables at about 0.8 of the way through, so you can scroll bar and not have to suck down the 40,000 emails to get there. Um, I don't know if the evolution guys do that. Certainly, um, KDE doesn't do that yet. Um, there's enough to do it. There's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. So really what we've done is we've said there's going to be an exchange or open change server. There's a library that comes from... Sorry for all the people who've got their heads sideways. I can't rotate. No, that's not going to work. Um, there's a, a library that KDE provides that basically takes dbus calls in one side and something sensible comes out the other side that you can tune into an application. What then happens approximately is that there's some calls into libmappy, that's the open change client library. And that in turn calls into some Samba code and this is why reliance on Samba 4 is, is really important to us, but at least it's one of the reasons. Um, all of the really nasty marshalling, unmarshalling code comes out of Sam before. And remember I said that there was some documentation that I really didn't want to read and look really ugly? Don't need to. All handled by Samba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the middle, there's some glue code. And that's the bit that I'm going to... Well, that's the bit that, that I wrote a prototype of and my summer of code student, Alan Alvarez, did a lot of work in. Um, that in turn makes... So this is local dbus. This is a local application, inter-process communication, remember? And that in turn makes Exchange RPC over TCP IP calls. In time, we would like to be able to do Exchange RPC over HTTP. For people who like mar Microsoft marketing, that's Outlook anywhere. Um, and that shouldn't be too hard to do just as soon as Yelma puts it into here. There's, there will almost be no changes required on the, on the open change code. Um, you had a question, and I'm not sure I answered it. Yeah, that should be doable in Akinati. There's a model view idea that's built into, into Qt4. And we should be able to say, get me the events between this range and this range. So we might not be able to say 80%, but we might have to say, you've told me there's 3,000 emails. Get me the ones that are between 0.75 of 3,000 and 0.85 of 3,000. You cannot run Akinati server. This is, there's no authentication across DBus. This has to run, this has to run locally. And for people who don't like um, MySQL, unlucky, it, ha it has to have a local MySQL server. We, we did, a, there's, there's been a lot of work done. Um, and for all the people who'd like to talk about why that's a really bad idea, there's an FAQ that talks about why lib um, SQL Lite didn't do it for us and why it isn't Postgres and I, I want, it wasn't my call and I won't touch it. What's the database There's a local cache and also some configuration information. But it's multi-reader threaded and some other stuff. And that's why SQLite didn't do it apparently. It isn't. It is not. There's no, Evolution doesn't do Akinati. It has a local, a, a different back end. I understand it's called Evolution Data Server, but I've never tried it. Evolution 
So it essentially takes this part and evolution is linked to it, is my understanding. It might be linked to evolution data server. I didn't look that closely at the implementation. They had really nice screenshots though. The question was about whether centralizing it at the enterprise level would have um, copying between one Akinati server and another. Not so. The Akinati process is a client side, sorry, the Akinati processes are all client side. Only client side. So the replication would occur on the server side, and you would have each client has this, this running. So if you're logged in in three places, you get separate instances and separate, probably separate local cache. Another question? <coughs> there was, the question was about whether Akinati was going to live on freedesktop.org. There was talk about trying to host this server section and some of the documentation on freedesktop.org. Um, our proposal was refused. Um, I, there, there is a backstory to that, um, but I don't have the facts, and making them up is probably not a good thing to do in a talk. <laughs> Interesting as it might be. Um, I said I'd do some demos. Because, like, what could go wrong? Um, so my demo set up, and it's all running on my laptop. This machine is just SSH'd into it. You'll see that in a moment. Um, has a... This laptop, which looks a lot like this laptop, is, is running native. It has Fedora 9. It has OpenChange and Akinati. Subversion from yesterday for both those things. What could have gone wrong? <laughs> that talks to an, a Microsoft Exchange server. It's actually a small business server, 2003. That's the test environment I have. That's running on a virtual machine. I also have a Windows XP with Outlook running on a, on a virtual machine. It probably has some random IP address. Anyone want to see the demos? Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions while I um while I fudge this? So these are the two virtual machines. So I thought I'd start off with something really simple. I thought I'd start off with something really simple. So what this is doing is basically going out using my command line tool and it's saying for this pre-configured user that I set up using another command line tool that basically establishes local profile information um, to say this is the calendar. It's got three appointments total, none of them unread. The container class, which is essentially the folder that this lives in, is of type um, interpersonnel folder. That's what the IPF stands for. Um, appointment, and that's the folder ID. That folder ID becomes important for some of the really fancy things you'd like to do. Um, there's one contact, zero unread. There's 10 deleted items, probably the demos that I was trying before, of which four are unread, and so far down. Um, we can show comments 
if there's any associated with um, with the folder. So that's basically what you would see. using Windows XP. There'll be a short delay. So somehow there's a way to show the mail. So those were the two items. That that get created by default when you create an account. Uh, and you actually see two and one of them is unread. Okay. Um, there'll be a short, there'll be a small shell scripting activity that will uh, will do that for you. Um, except we probably won't do HTML email because it's evil and stuff, right? Um, you can find out the users that are currently set up on this box. So global address list style stuff. Um, you can actually get your mail. Yeah, it's in HTML. So this is where we called it. We get a message ID. You get the subject, the from, the to, where there's attachments, some really ugly looking HTML. Um, was there a comment or a suggestion? Um, yeah, essentially, oops. So I'll show that again because it's so cool. Um, so it makes use of these two libraries and there's some tools, utility code that does command line parsing and conversion of this event back into something that looks like text. Um, you have installed Small Business Server 2003 on your computer network. It does all this stuff. Um, there's got to be more than that, right? Because we said email was pretty easy and no one really cared, except for everyone. Um, we'd like to get the appointments. This command line tool doesn't do a great job of displaying them. I'm going to show you a little bit more about dealing with appointments. Um, because some of these are recurring appointments and there's no recurring showing in these ones. But you do get to find out at least where you're meant to be on a particular day. You might need grep or something to make more creative use of that. But you could grep it and that would be useful. Um, talked about address books, having private address books. Oops. That's going to be tragic. So if you had a one, if you had more, you get more. But um, if you had an address book entry, 10 minutes to go. So if you've got more questions, now would be a good time to ask them. Wait a sec, 10 minutes till the questions start or 10 minutes till I get kicked off? Okay, um, the demos have to go faster. Um, okay, 
being able to read your mail is really important. But we'd like to be able to send them as well. So what that does is basically says, I'd like to send a mail to that user with that subject. Thanks for coming to the talk. Send. And what do you know? And you, like, that could have just been fudged, right? So... First, I'll show the result, and then you should be able to see how it worked. So there's a new mail thing showing up there, making it all run really slow. And you saw the... Somewhere up there... ..is the mail we sent. So... The command was basically dash dash two, dash dash subject, dash dash body, dash dash send mail. So that's this one. Same as what we saw. And there's more stuff you can put in there. Um, you can add attachments. You can do stuff to mailing lists that is just... The, the status. Um, it's probably best demonstrated by demo. Um, so this one is similar, It's except it's doing inline HTML. Um, maybe doing inline HTML. Sorry for how slow this is, but I'm SSHD and so... to a machine that's only got 2 gig of RAM and I'm running... So this is the second email we've sent. Uh, sorry. Um, we'd like to be able to send appointments, and you can invite people to appointments and stuff like that. Um, but you can see why these things started to get really, really long as we... So this one creates an appointment at that time, ends at that time, has a busy status of equal to busy, and you can have tentative and free... Um, the location, the subject, the body. You can do bodies with HTML. Um, and so now you see this new appointment, the closing party. So, Chris, no. Um, Uh, no, but I can do something slightly different. I can do the open change properties things, but I can't do a equivalent to send mail. Um, there's there's probably a better way though. Um, I'll s I can create tasks that will work too. Um, you should write that tool. That would be really useful. Um, I can say, I can say, take that mailbox and put it into inbox format. So, and this worked bidirectionally too. So, if you subsequently delete something in this, apparently it will delete it on the server. Um, of course, with inbox, make if you're going to run this out of cron. Make sure that you and Cron aren't playing at the same time. You should write that too. <laughs> um, 
So we've now converted it to inbox format, apparently. And so they're base64 encoded for the attachments and other things that you'd expect. Um, I've been working on this one, taking the exchange output and dumping it as iCal. This turns out to be a lot more difficult than it looks, primarily because iCal is really ugly. Um, so this is just dumping out the command line. This doesn't turn into tools yet. And, um, but we see the appointment that we created, um, and it mostly looks all right. Um, we're doing some of the right escaping here. Um, the time zone bit doesn't look quite right to me, but I can probably fix that, and I will fix that before I commit this. This is the only copy, so please don't steal my laptop. Um, okay. I've only got about three minutes left. And so it doesn't appear on the um, recording. Feel free to turn the camera off anytime. <laughs> um,